It is difficult to turn on the television or open a newspaper without hearing about genes. Indeed, genetics is so influential in modern society, it's easy to forget what a recent phenomenon this is. From a little-known area of scientific research, genetics has exploded into the public consciousness, bringing promises of personalized medicine, over-the-counter paternity tests, and even offers to trace your ancient ancestors through your DNA. Our growing understanding of the connection between genes and traits such as human disease and physical characteristics, crop yields and the productivity of farm animals, supplies the media with an inexhaustible source of sound bites full of promise for a better world. Scientifically and socially pervasive as it is today, genetics is a young discipline whose birth and development spans little more than a century. We've come a long way in that time. At the beginning of the 20th century, heredity was an abstract concept and only its most ardent supporters saw the potential impact of a detailed understanding of its mechanism. Today, this mechanism is taught in schools and the human genome is just one of many that have been mapped, sequenced and analysed. Depending on your point of view, genetic research promises a panacea for world problems of disease and shortages of energy and food or poses a sinister threat to the future of life on Earth. The only thing that's certain is that genetics can't be ignored. Cambridge has played significant roles in these developments, beginning with the coinage of the very word genetics by William Bateson, an academic at the University of Cambridge. Bateson not only conceived the word, but played a crucial role in the establishment of genetics as a discipline. As a consequence of Bateson's pioneering studies on Mendelism before he left Cambridge in 1910, in 1912 a chair was endowed in the university for the experimental study of heredity and of development by descent. It was established by an anonymous donor in honour of the former Prime Minister Arthur Balfour and became the Arthur Balfour Professor of Genetics in recognition of his efforts to find a permanent endowment for the post, believed to be the first ever established chair of genetics in the world. It is now a hundred years since the creation of the post, which is hosted at the Department of Genetics of the University, where researchers continue to explore the many mysteries that remain between genes and traits. The way that traits are passed from one generation to the next has always intrigued us. In the book of Genesis, we can read how Jacob became rich by selective breeding of animals over three and a half thousand years ago. Throughout recorded history, a fascination with family trees and the importance of blood as a determinant of fate and social position illustrates just how central heredity has been to the organization of human society. Despite centuries of speculation about the mechanism of inheritance, it remained a mystery until the 19th century. It took the patience and insight of a Moravian monk to gain the first real clues. Gregor Mendel was not primarily a biologist, but was trained in the physical sciences. Breeding pea plants, he studied the inheritance of characters such as height, flower colour and seed morphology. From the ratios of characters in the progeny, he formulated rules that described their inheritance. Mendel concluded that the traits were associated with discrete elements or determinants that were passed unaltered from one generation to the next. This was very different from the views of many others, including Charles Darwin, who still subscribed to the views of the Greek philosopher Hippocrates that inheritance was associated with mixing of characters. Mendel published his studies in 1865 in the proceedings of his local Natural History Society. Despite his attempts to bring the work to the attention of a wider scientific community, it had little impact until more than 30 years later. Indeed, it was more than 15 years after Mendel's death in 1884 that three researchers, Hugo de Vries, Eric von Tischemach and Karl Korins, reached similar conclusions and Mendel's work was rediscovered for the 20th century. Science progress very often occurs as a result of what is called a Eureka moment. On a train trip to London to talk to the Royal Horticultural Society, William Bateson, who'd been puzzling about the mechanism of heredity, read a paper by Hugo de Vries, which discussed the, men the results of Gregor Mendel. As a result of reading that paper, Bateson changed not only the topic of his talk to the Horticultural Society, but also the whole course of his research. At the time, heredity was viewed very much in terms of Darwinian descent. That is, continuous variation, 
which occurred by small incremental changes, which were passed down the generations over long periods of time. Mendel's view of heredity, on the other hand, was that heredity worked by having discrete units of inheritance, which were passed unchanged from one generation to another. Bateson became a passionate advocate of Mendelian principles and translated Mendel's papers into English and worked very hard over the next few years to popularise the research done by this once obscure Moravian monk. In 1905, Bateson coined the term genetics to describe the study of heredity and biological inheritance. By that time, he was involved in an extensive research program aimed at generalising Mendel's laws to as the examples of as many characters as possible in plants and animals, in his case, sweet peas and chickens. In that time, research grants were scarce in Cambridge, and the Cambridge scientific establishment didn't always look well on Bateson's mixture of farming and gardening and maths. So he turned for support to collaboration with Edith Saunders and other students from Newnham College. Here in the University Library, the manuscript section contains a large selection of Bateson and Punnett's early notebooks. Bateson and his co-workers, Edith Saunders and Reginald Punnett, in the early years of the 20th century carried out a large number of experiments which established Mendelian principles as a sound general framework for the study of heredity. Bateson was succeeded by Reginald Punnett as Professor of Biology. Shortly thereafter, the Arthur Balfour Professorship was created and Punnett became its first incumbent in 1912. The university provided Whittingham Lodge, now part of Churchill College, as both a professorial residence and a place for the study and teaching of genetics. Ponnet had the habit of standing in the right place at the right time. He was uh, taken on by Bateson in 1904 as a sort of assistant. He had of course attended Bateson's lectures but he wasn't uh, in a formal sense a student of Bateson's. Um, and uh, he had written to Bateson asking if some of Bateson's experiments, which were being undertaken in Grantchester, um, might uh, provide information that he was interested in about coat colour in, in, in the mouse. And Bateson at that time had just got a, some money from a friend of his to employ somebody to help him with the work in Grantchester. His first choice, uh, Leonard Doncaster, uh, didn't want to do it, so he thought of Punnett. And so Punnett very gladly accepted. He, he uh, declined the income, as a matter of fact, because he was already a fellow of Keyes, so he didn't have to worry about things like that, and um, started working uh, with Bateson. And then in 1908, the university did produce first a readership and then a professorship, a professorship of biology, specifically for Bateson, specifically to teach genetics. And in 1910, I think Bateson then preferring the sort of facilities that he might be offered if he became the director of the, the first director of the new John Innes Research Institute in, in Surrey, um, to the rather meagre facilities but, but, but high status that he would get by being permanently a professor in Cambridge, um, chose to resign the professorship of biology and, and, and become the first director of the John Innes. So uh, Punnett was standing in the right place at the right time and he became Bateson's successor as professor of biology. But almost immediately, um, moves were afoot then, largely uh, as a result of initiatives taken by Arthur Balfour, to establish a permanent professorship of genetics. And when this was achieved uh, in 1912, uh, uh, as we know, Arthur Balfour immediately wrote to Bateson inviting him back from the John Innes. And Bateson said, no, but I do know somebody who is in all ways perfectly qualified to take the, the chair, so Ponnet was appointed and uh, that was a very happy appointment. Ponnet was already um, quite well known, really for, for two things. First of all, it was he and Bateson who discovered the phenomenon of linkage. Uh, they did so in the sweet pea. Um, 
much of the experimental work being done in Grantchester, some of it uh, in Impington, and this of course, the phenomenon of linkage turned out to be a general phenomenon throughout, throughout the whole uh, living world. So that was a very important discovery. And in the course of the work which led to this, uh, Punnett invented the little diagram which is eponymously known after him, uh, Punnett Square, and that itself was a very important part of um, the solution to the problem of linkage. Punnett was able to then branch out a little bit to employ uh, one or two assistant staff, but no academic staff, no, no graduate staff, and so far as I know he never had any research students. So from 1914 onwards a sort of proto-department was created here without students, um, with only Punnett's private books, um, with no defined research policy or anything like that. And it really wasn't until Fisher came in 1943 and started thinking about teaching and students and so forth. Fisher had been uh, appointed during the war in uh, 1943. He had previously been the Galton Professor of, of Human Genetics at University College London and had been evacuated during the war to, uh, to Rothamsted where he also lived. But when Ponnet retired in 1940, the professorship was then left vacant until Fisher came in October 1943. So he couldn't do very much in the immediate um, time after his appointment, of course, because it was still wartime. But in 1945 and 1946, he started making moves to try and establish a proper department, having inherited this house from Punnett, as it were, provided by the university, not as a department, uh, but as the professor's private house, in accordance with the original deed of trust from Arthur Balfour and Lord Isha. So <clears throat> Fisher set about trying to establish some kind of teaching based on this house. And he then tried to start a half subject in part one of the natural sciences tripos of genetics. But he was rather shot down by the botanists and zoologists about this, who said that they didn't want him to be poaching students from them, and that it would be much better if he started a part two genetics. And that is indeed what I studied from 1956-57. His, his influence on, on his students and those who knew him from that time, I think is his greatest legacy. During the 1950s, Cambridge had been the stage for a dramatic discovery. In 1953, Francis Crick and James Watson published a model for the double helical structure of DNA that offered the possibility of understanding heredity on a molecular scale. This began a revolution that transformed genetics into the science we know today. Ironically, this seminal research took place not in the Department of Genetics, but in the Cavendish Laboratory, where the Medical Research Council Laboratory was originally located. After Fisher's retirement in 1957, Francis Crick was considered for the Professorship of Genetics, but the electors couldn't agree, and ultimately in 1959, John Thode was appointed. He was to occupy this position until 1984. Thode's early career had focused on improving our understanding of how radiation affects chromosomes, but in Cambridge, his main interest was the study of evolution using the fruit fly as a model organism. John came down, took the chair, and his first sig signal act was to move the department from Whittingham Lodge to the old vet school in Milton Road. That was a very brave move, actually, because the vet school was very isolated. It was kind of halfway to Ely. But it had the advantages, advantage of having lots of space uh, and lots of land uh, for greenhouses and a mouse house. J John expanded the part two class. In my year, which was 64, I think, um, it was five students, um, three of us who became professional geneticists. <clears throat> and it's now over 30. But more importantly, he established the tradition in Cambridge uh, that genetics was a, a broad church and taught uh, across the entire spectrum of the subject, from molecular genetics uh, to population genetics, which now are very intimately connected, but at the time were not by any means. John's own research 
uh, was very innovatory and far ahead of its time and not really appreciated. In the late 1960s, there was a revolution in teaching of biology in Cambridge with the uh, abolishment of the traditional zoology and botany teaching, uh, first in the first year and then a few years later in the second year. And John was instrumental in that change. Um, in the introduction of a cross-disciplinary course called Biology of Cells uh, to replace first year zoology uh, and first year botany and to include for the first time uh, in undergraduate teaching uh, uh, genetics. It, it was of course taught in town on the Downing site and New Museum site and that caused great problems to the Department of Genetics, which was way out in Milton Road. And John sacrificed uh, a year to get hold of the agriculture building. And we moved after that was renovated. And that was a major change. Um, it uh, facilitated not only uh, our interaction with other departments from the point of view of teaching, uh, but also from the point of view of research. Throughout the 1980s and 90s, the department continued to grow under the stewardship of Professor John Fincham and then Peter Goodfellow, who came to Cambridge soon after discovering the key male-determining gene in mammals. This was a period of growth, and many members of the department were making notable contributions to their field. Michael Ashburner, who was part of the department for almost five decades, continued his work on development alongside Gabby Dover, who drove forward his evolutionary studies into the molecular age. Notable too was Mike Aikham's work that bridged these two areas and contributed to the growing field of evolutionary developmental biology. Another developmental biologist, Alfonso Martinez Arias, was subsequently responsible for reinvigorating links between genetics and physicists at the Cavendish Laboratory. The most celebrated work in this period was the discovery of mouse embryonic stem cells by Martin Evans. Martin's research group, including Liz Robertson and Alan Bradley, made fundamental discoveries that have been central to subsequent developments in basic biology and in medical research. In recognition of this, Martin was the joint recipient of the Nobel Prize for Physiology or Medicine in 2007. The current Balfour professor is David Glover, David was previously at Imperial College and then Dundee University and came to Cambridge in the late 1990s. Through his interest in the cell cycle and mitosis, he introduced a blend of genetics and cell biology that is a key strength of the department today. We've used Drosophila, the fruit fly, as a model in which to study the cell biology of cell division. So here we see a fluorescent video micrograph of mitosis in action in the very early Drosophila embryo. In red are the microtubules, which are the tracks along which the chromosomes will migrate to the two spindle poles. In blue are just parts of the chromosomes, a region called the kinetochore, the region to which the microtubules attach. The microtubules attach to the kinetochore and the chromosomes are pulled to the two poles. And you can see here the beauty of these two consecutive rounds of division where we can follow all of these events. By making mutants in th that are defective in the proteins supplied by the mother, we can examine what happens when individual components of this mitotic machinery are missing or malfunctioning. And this informs us about how the process occurs in normally dividing cells. Today, genetics is no longer just a scientific discipline, it has become the language of biology in the same way that mathematics provides the language of physics and engineering. It combines powerful tools that can be applied to virtually any biological problem with the flexibility of approach that has enabled it to stay at the forefront of biological science for a century. Advances of the 1990s, when the department began to use genetic approaches to address problems in cell biology, shows just how well genetics adds value to related fields. However, the Cambridge Department has never lost sight of its tradition in quantitative genetics, and this is seen today in a new wave of young evolutionary population geneticists who blend the mathematical underpinning of the field 
with modern genomics. Looking outwards, the department is developing quantitative approaches to cell and developmental biology at the interfaces with physics and engineering. The future is exciting and we are confident that in the second century the department will continue to make major contributions to biology from its strong philosophical foundation in genetics.